the Lord became less and less important to me. We've got a wonderful Lord. He was a perfect sacrifice, a perfect Savior. It's a perfect salvation. But it's one that even those of us that are saved, if we're not careful, can allow things to get into our lives that separate us from that relationship with God. And as I progressed throughout my career in football, that's exactly what I did. Those things of serving the Lord became less and less important to me. And the possible fame and fortune that I could have as a football player became more and more important to me. So I drifted further and further away from the Lord. I enjoyed my four years in South Carolina. My freshman year was 1980. I had an opportunity to be a teammate with the greatest football player I've ever been on the football field with, George Rogers. And if those of you that were able to watch George play, I think you would agree. What a special talent, one of the greatest running backs I've ever seen. We had a tremendous year. George wins the Heisman Trophy. I'll never forget the night he flew in with the Heisman Trophy from New York City. The team was bussed out to the airport to meet him. And there were over 8,000 Gamecock fans at the airport to meet George that night. So a very special way to start my Gamecock career. Then I followed up in 81 as a sophomore. Now, in 1980, I was a backup. I lettered, but I played mostly special teams. But I started from 81 on. Uh, we were a 6-6 six six ball club in 1981. And after the 81 season, we're coming off a 6-6 six six season with, with a very young football team, a very inexperienced football team. And I thought our head coach had done a tremendous job. But he was fired after the 81 season. Coach Carlin was, and that left sort of a bad taste in my mouth because the only guy that lost his job on that staff was the head coach, Jim Carlin. The entire staff was kept intact. Our defensive coordinator was moved up to head coach, and I decided I just didn't like that. I went there because of Coach Carlin. He meant a lot to me. So I did not play in 1982. I decided to set out that year. I was going to go to work, save some money, and get back in school and pay for my own education. I had no plans of ever stepping back on the football field at the University of South Carolina. Well, Richard Bell, who was the head coach that year, was fired after one season. And Joe Morrison was named our head football coach. And I got a call shortly after Joe got the job from an associate athletic director who asked me if I'd be interested in meeting with Joe and possibly talking to him about coming back and joining the team. I said I would, but I can't promise you anything. Well, I met with Joe and immediately just fell in love with the personality with, with, with what I thought could potentially be a great opportunity for me. We had a five and six season in 1983, but in 1984 on a team that was loaded with 25 senior football players on it, we had a magical year. And up until three years ago was the greatest year that we had ever had in the University of South Carolina. We had a big win against Georgia, as you saw, the only time in my career that we beat Georgia. Later on, we went to Notre Dame. Scored 22 points in the fourth quarter to come back and beat them on their own field at the foot of that big building that they says has touchdown Jesus on. So in that end zone, we scored 22 or 24 points in that fourth quarter to win that game. When we got back to the airport in Columbia that night, there were 12,000 people to greet us at the airport. And our ride back from the airport to the athletic dorms over off Rosewood Drive, it was something like you saw out of a ticker tape parade when the Yankees would win the World Series in New York City. There were people on the side of the road lined up five, six, seven deep. They had all the traffic lights blocked off with policemen, and it was that way probably seven or eight miles back to our athletic dorm. Just those great Carolina fans and the appreciation that they had for us of what we were doing. Later on, we beat Florida State in a very special game at home. And I see my Florida State brother back here high five. <laughs> The year before, they beat us 45 to 30 in Tallahassee. So once again, it was the only time we beat them in my career. So we seem to do a lot of that last senior year. So we're number two in the nation at that point. We're 9 and 0. Nebraska's number one. They're 9 and 0. We go to play Navy, one of the worst football teams on our schedule that year. Nebraska loses. All we've got to do is beat Navy. And we're going to be the number one ranked team in the country. And after that, all we've got to do is go to Clemson and beat Clemson. We're playing in the Orange Bowl for the national championship. Now, Coach Porter has done some great things in the last several years, but nobody has ever come as close to playing for a national championship as we did. We were one win away from putting ourselves in that position. And Navy beat us like we stole some. I mean, they kicked our teeth down our throat. We just weren't ready for it. 
We beat Florida State the week before. We had Clemson the week after, so they caught us at a good time. So the following week, we got to go to Clemson and play. And fellas, I tell you, it was like a, somebody had died in the family all week of practice. That Sunday, we would meet as a team every Sunday. We had a theater, like, up under the stadium. And it would see 90 to 100 guys, and all of our team would be in there. And for nine weeks, Coach Morrison walked in to conduct the team meeting following the previous game on Saturday. And we were loud and raucous. We were joyous because we had won every game. That day he walked in, he didn't have to tell anybody to be quiet. <laughs> Nobody said a word. And he walked up to the chalkboard and went one, two, three, four. And beside one, he put number one. Beside two, he put national championship. Beside three, he put orange ball. And beside four, he put two million dollars, which back then was what the payout was for the orange ball. And he whirled around and he looked at us. He said, that's what you guys just messed up yesterday. He said, I hope you can live with yourself. And he walked out. So naturally, we weren't very confident in ourselves. So when we get to Clemson the following week before you can snap your fingers, it's 21 to nothing. And I mean, they are kicking our teeth down our throat. But we finally were able to get ourselves together, pull ourselves together, got some things settled at halftime and came back out in the second half. Scored a touchdown with less than 50 seconds left to go in the game and beat them 22-21. Again, the only time I'd ever beat Clemson in my Carolina career. But we did it there, and it was the first time they'd ever been beat in their all orange uniforms. At that point, they were 26-0 and in all orange. So it was a great way to end the regular season. We finished it up by going to the Gator Bowl. Lost a very close game to Oklahoma State. They scored a touchdown with about a minute to go to beat us 21 to 14, or 20 to 14. And uh, ended a great season for us. And up until three years ago, the greatest season in the history of the university. And I was very fortunate, as the pastor has said, to be a consensus All-American. I never dreamed of anything like that. I just love playing football. I never imagined in my wildest dreams that something like that could happen to me. But I'll tell you what was more important to me than even that, was that year my teammates voted me the captain of that team. My coaches voted me the most valuable player on that team. And it means a lot more to you when those that see you every day, those that work with you every day, those that are around you every day, thought that much of me to do that. So it was a great honor for me, a great year. I have great memories of it. It was a great four years of my life that I do not regret. But as I told you earlier, I was saved when I was 11 years old. And the longer I played, the more I got away from serving the Lord. I had two tryouts in the NFL. I signed with the Tampa Bay Bucks in 1985, and in 1986, they traded me to the Atlanta Falcons. And the Falcons released me prior to the start of the 86 season. I have always been a professional wrestling freak. The only thing I loved more than pro wrestling at that point in my life Obviously, it should have been the Lord, but it was football. And I had decided about my junior year in college. I had a buddy of mine that attended the Citadel. We both were pretty big guys, pretty athletic guys. He was a pretty good talker, so we thought, hey, when football is over for me, he didn't participate in sports here at the Citadel, but I said, man, when football is over for me, whatever point that is, if it's after college, if it's after an NFL career, I think we ought to give pro wrestling a shot and see what we can do. Well, we did. In 1987, I went through a school, he and I did in Columbia, South Carolina, that trained professional wrestlers. He made it about six months. I made it 13 years and had a very successful career. I started out my career working as a character called The Trooper. We were on, uh, I worked for a company called AWA. We were on ESPN every Monday through Friday from 4 to 5 o'clock. Well, that company folded, and there was an upstart company out of Dallas, Texas called the Global Wrestling Federation and I went to work for them. And we were in Dallas getting ready to tape our very first TV taping ever. We were literally three hours away from our very first TV taping and we had inherited that spot on ESPN. Monday through Friday, we were gonna be on worldwide TV from four to five o'clock every afternoon. Great exposure. Well, the promoter and the owner of the company approached me prior to the start of that very first show and said, we've got an idea we wanna to throw to you and see what you think. We want to use you in a big way, but not as the trooper. We've got a different idea. At this time, we were involved in trying to liberate Kuwait. Iraq had invaded Kuwait, 
and we had gone into the right Kuwait under President Bush. And patriotism was at a high, I mean, a, maybe close to an all-time high, maybe only World War II had been better. And they said, we think it is a great time for a very patriotic character. So would you consider putting on a red, white, and blue mask, red, white, and blue tight, tights, red, white, and blue trunks, red, white, and blue boots, and calling yourself a patriot? I said, man, I'm willing to try anything. I'll do it. And that night, they had the outfit with them. They had already planned this all out. That night.